Good morning. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. This is the first Sabbath of the last month of the year. And um, normally in Sabbath school, we'd begin with a song. So I've chosen a song today, hymn 245. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to read um, a couple of the verses because the lyrics are so beautiful and appropriate for what we are studying. The hymn is more about Jesus. More about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. So that is basically the whole point of our study for this quarter on education. Let's have a word of prayer before we go into our, our lesson study. Our most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, Lord, first we want to thank you for life, for health, for strength. Thank you for blessing us in countless ways that we see and ways that we don't. Thank you for allowing us to see another beautiful Sabbath morning. Lord, we ask now that your spirit will fill all those who are listening, whether they're here in the sanctuary or whether listening in your homes or in your cars, wherever you may be. Lord, grant us the Sabbath day blessing. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So unbelievably, we are in lesson 10 of this quarter. The quarter has seemed to have really flown by. Our lesson for today I found to be quite difficult. <laughs> and the topic is education in arts and sciences. So I'm going to try to get my slideshow started. I don't always have good luck. Well, Elder Robert, I'm not doing something. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we're studying about education in arts and sciences. Every week we're given a memory text. This week's text is one that's very familiar to us. It's found in Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So what does it mean by arts and sciences? Education that includes the arts and sciences has these types of subjects. In the arts, of course, you study visual arts and music but also subjects like geography, philosophy, history, sociology, and so forth, the humanities. Sciences include the true sciences, chemistry, math, physics, biology, computer science. So often when a teacher tries to um, apply biblical knowledge while teaching the sciences, all they will do is pull out a certain verse and, you know, use that as evidence that they are, are teaching from a biblical perspective. But it means more than just using a certain Bible verse to back up your theories. Okay. Uh, 
a simple incorporation of scripture in a textbook lesson is only a small part of true education. So our goal for this whole quarter has been to learn what true education really is. Now, our lesson tells us that true education is salvific, which means it leads to salvation. And that is what we are here at church for, to learn the ways of salvation. True education is also redemptive. And so this is something that you don't find in an, or, in an ordinary classroom education talking about salvation and redemption. But according to our lesson, this is what needs to take place even while you're teaching sciences and art. We need God's word to inform the teaching of every discipline. It doesn't matter what subject you're teaching. Without God's word, we can lose sight of God's enormity his sovereignty as the creator and the sustainer of our world. So on this introduction to the lesson, the question is, what principles are involved in how the arts and sciences can be taught from the Christian perspective and the Christian worldview? A few weeks ago, we studied about the importance of having a Christian worldview. So first of all, the principle is that God is God alone. There is evidence of the living God in all of his creation. Now, as you can see on the picture, I put um, a lily of the valley plant. A lily of the valley plant is a good example of God's love. Uh, in, in my generation, we used to sing this song called Pass It On, and it says it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you experience it, you want to pass it on. It spreads from one person to the next. And that's why I put the picture of the lily of the valley this is a kind of plant that spreads. You'd start out with just a couple of the um, plants in your yard, and before you know it, the lily of the valley has spread across your whole yard. You have to constantly weed them because they, they grow so fast. So in everything in nature, you can find evidence of God. Our lesson mentions this example. The loving kindness of God can be seen in the place that a fetus develops. It develops right below the steady, the steady beating of the mother's heart. We're always near God's heart. There's never a time when he forgets about us. And our lesson continues to say that as the child grows inside of her mother's womb, or his mother, whichever, <laughs> that the mother can see the babies out there in front of her. The expectant mother is always aware of her child. Our Heavenly Father is always aware of us as his children. So there are many more examples that we can use. We could spend all day just pulling out example after example from nature. But there are some texts that are given on Sunday's lesson that tell us about God's work as the creator. The first text is found in Romans 1, verses 18 through 21. It reads like this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So in other words, we can understand about God through looking at the things that he has made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So in these verses of Romans chapter 1, Paul says that the people who reject God as our creator will be without excuse when they stand before him in the day of judgment. Because there has been so much evidence that he exists from the things that he has made. And so um, it's kind of hard to see here. I, I think on the, your screens at home, you, you may be able to see it better. But there's a text here that Paul also wrote in Romans, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Our next text is found in Psalm, in Psalm 19. The first verse, of course, was our, our memory text. But I want to read a couple more verses that come after it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So in other words, well, it says their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So um, in, in this translation, the word line actually means their sound. So what the psalmist is saying, David, what David is saying in these verses is, all you have to do is look up at the sky. Every single day, every single night, the stars are telling you about the creator. It says there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Everybody can understand this, is what David is saying. And their sound echoes throughout the whole world. The next text, oh, before we go to the next text, this, this one I found to be pretty interesting. This is a quotation from Colonel Frederick Drew Gregory. He was a space shuttle pilot and in fact was, had the distinction of being the first African American to um, pilot the space shuttle. This is what he said. When you're in space and you're looking down at Earth and you see this perfect globe beneath you and you see the organization and the non-chaos, you have to feel, as I did, that there was one great being, one great force that made this happen. Then he continued to say this. It gives great comfort to realize that the person who created this was also looking over you and making sure everything was going to work out right. So the heavens declare the glory of God. This is the next text given on Sunday's lesson, Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. It says, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all, the hosts of heaven worships you. So, our lesson tells us then that Christian education 
must work from the premise that God is the creator and the sustainer of everything that exists. That's our first given. God made the world. God made everything in the world. God made the universe. Unfortunately, worldly education doesn't teach that. It works on the assumption that there is no God. So as Christians, we want to make sure that we start with that foundation always. And as we look at the beautiful world that God has created, we can draw hope and comfort from the incredible wonder and beauty in our world, especially when we're going through some stuff. When we have our personal trials, when we're suffering, how can we find hope? By going to nature. Because when we look at nature, then we remember the one who created it is still looking out for us. And so like the song says, oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. So when you contemplate on nature, what is your reaction? Then sings my soul, my savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when we think about the greatness of God, our problems don't seem so overwhelming anymore because we know we serve one who has the answer to everything. Even if we can't see it, we begin to develop faith and trust in him. So we're moving on now to Monday's lesson, which is called The Beauty of Holiness. I like the references to Psalms because the Psalms were basically songs. They are poems set to music, and I love music. So this Psalm says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And that's found in Psalm 96, 9. So the question is asked, what should the beauty of holiness mean to a Christian? How should the beauty of holiness impact what we teach about art and the beauty often associated with art? Well, look at some of the things that God has made. By looking at nature, we can tell this about God. He loves beauty. You can look at the many um, different varieties of flowers, their shapes, their sizes, their smells, the beautiful fish. I, I used to watch this, um, this program. I would, I would tape it and watch all the reruns. It was called Tank. You know, these guys would make these elaborate tanks. But they, I, I watched it because they would import these fish from all over the place. The most beautiful fish you can even, it's like somebody just took a coloring book and just started you know, making beautiful patterns. But somebody did. God did that. Look at the beauty of the stallion or in the bluebird or the majestic tiger. All of the things in creation point to a God who loves detail and loves beauty. So studying the arts and the sciences then should draw us closer to the character of God and to the heart of God. More than anything else, what is God's character? It can be summed up in three words. God is love. This is a quotation that comes from the book Steps to Christ. If you have not read it lately, that is on your recommendation list for the coming year. You can never read the book Steps to Christ too much because we can never find ourselves too close to him. So this is what the servant of the Lord had to say. 
God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. The lovely birds, the delicately tinted flowers, the lofty trees of the forest all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. So definitely, God is the lover of the beautiful. And on Monday's lesson, if you have your quarterly, just before the little heading read, it, um, in Steps to Christ later on, Sister White makes this statement, that God is a lover of the beautiful. And above all that is outwardly attractive, he loves the beauty of character. So this is the next thing that our lesson brings out. We're talking about arts and sciences, if you just joined us. Because we are a part of God's own artwork. What does David say? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And also scientific phenomena. Look at all the different systems within a human being. Because we are a part of God's own artwork and scientific phenomena, we can also learn more about our own identity in Christ. Knowing who Christ is, knowing what he has done, makes us view ourselves in a whole different light. All of a sudden, if you had feelings of worthlessness, now you realize, I am of value. I am of value. Christ died for me. But not only did he die, look at the first picture here. It shows the cross in the background, but the big picture shows the opening to his tomb. And this is a verse from Mark. It says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. About this time last year, our pastor went to the Holy Land and he sent back this text of, of him standing at the place where Jesus was buried. And he said, I'm here at Jesus' tomb. But guess what? There's no body. Jesus has risen. And so, once again, I'm referencing a song. Because Jesus lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And so what does that do to my identity? I look at myself and how I once was. Then I came to God. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But our creator can recreate. And he made something beautiful of my life. And he'll do the same for all of us if we just come to him and acknowledge who he is. Our lesson also gives us a word of warning. Beauty alone isn't necessarily good or holy. So how do we know what is good and holy? Psalm 119, 105 tells us, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We know what's good because the Bible tells us what is good. So many things in our society are deemed as beautiful, but they're not really good. Society dictates what our standards of beauty are, but it's superficial. <laughs> when I was growing up, my, my grandmother used to say this to us girls, pretty is as pretty does. In other words, it doesn't matter how you look on the outside. What matters is your character. So we want to make sure 
that we hold up the word of God as our standard when we're qualifying something as good or something as beautiful or something as holy. Our next, um, our next subject that we're looking at on Tuesday's lesson is called experts in error. Experts in error. I have a, um, one of my students is um, learning to play the piano and she says, it's really hard. And I agree, it can be hard to play, to play the piano, especially if you practice a song and every time you practice it, you practice hitting that same wrong note. And then you get up to perform it, what are you gonna do? You're gonna hit that bad note in front of everybody. So this is what happens in the realm of education. People have become experts, but they're all wrong. So Paul gives this warning. He says, oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. Now, our lesson tells us, think about all the teaching, all the beliefs, not only now, but also throughout human history, that were flat out wrong. People's, people can be experts in error. So I stuck up a picture here of Christopher Columbus. Now he, he got one thing right. He believed the world was round. And we know now the world is round. We can see pictures of it that the, um, the uh, satellites take and see that the world is round. But when he came to the new world, he thought he was in India. And 500 some years later, the indigenous people of North America are still being called Indians because of Christopher Columbus's error. So in the world of science, there's profound error. Bi biological science today is based on the assumption that life just happened. It began billions of years ago just because. God didn't do it. There is no reason for it. So you can see how over time, according to biological science, that science that does not support the creation theory, man started out as something less than what he is now. That's in total contradiction to the word of God. The Bible tells us we started out in God's image and we fell from that point. So there are many changes that have taken place. And one of the changes was this. When God created the world, there was no such thing as death. Not even a leaf would drop off of a flower. And um, Sister White tells us that when, after Adam and Eve sinned, when they saw the first leaves fall, Adam mourned for that more than we mourn for the loss of a loved one because he saw that the whole physical world was affected by his moral and spiritual decision. But biological science doesn't take this kind of information into account. And so it says that the model followed by scientists today for the origin of life is often misleading. As a teacher, I taught my first years in an Adventist school. And then I began teaching in public school. And oh my goodness, the things that they teach the children. For example, in science class, they learn about animal adaptations. How over time, animals adapted to their environment and grew this or grew that, and it's just totally contrary to what we know 
that God created the animals too. They didn't evolve into the form that we see animals now, but this is what is being taught and supported by scientists. Science can effectively study and manipulate its purpose without acknowledgement of God. They get in their laboratories, they do their experiments, and they try to find reasons for everything. That's how scientific minds work. Is there anything wrong with that? No, absolutely not. But the problem lies where you leave God out of it. You can't leave God out of science because God is the one who created all the forces of nature. God is the one who knows how to put all the atoms together in such a way that we have the things that we do. So a Christian education and a worldview then looks at nature and sees that nature gives us evidence of God and it lets us know who God is. It gives us insight into him. We're moving to Wednesday's lesson now. Foolishness and wisdom. Once again, we're starting with a question. So what should true education, true Christian education be about? Just sticking a text in here or there? God desires that his people seek wisdom to treasure in it, to treasure it, and abound in it. Students of the arts and sciences utilize their talents to gain knowledge. When I was in college, I took some art classes and I loved learning about how to shade and bring things to life coming off of that piece of paper. So, also I remember when I took my, a biology class and we had to dissect a frog, I didn't really want to do it. I thought, oh, it's gonna be so disgusting. But my lab partner, you know, was the one who went ahead and made the incision and we opened up that frog and just the beauty of the systems inside that frog were amazing to me. It wasn't gross at all, like I thought it would be. But I could see how someone would want to pursue a, a career in medicine by looking at just how even in a simple being like a frog, you can see the order of creation. So students of the arts and scientists utilize their talents to gain knowledge and to pursue excellence in their studies. We can be capable of artistic brilliance and scientific breakthroughs because of knowledge and ability. So education is wonderful. Education is good. We need to be educated people. But the lesson says, what does a knowledge of the arts and science, sciences really mean if it doesn't involve knowing the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil, between truth and error. So these are things that cannot be left out in our fields of studies, whether we're studying art or whether we're in the laboratory studying sciences. So we're told that knowledge by itself is not necessarily a good thing. So what then is the key to true Christian education? We get our answer from the world's wisest man, King Solomon. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now when you talk about the fear of the Lord, it doesn't mean being afraid of him. The fear of the Lord is a convergence of many different things. Awe, reverence, adoration, 
honor, worship, confidence, thankfulness, and love. So when this, these are our, our emotions toward God, then that's how we begin on our path toward wisdom. Solomon also continues Okay, we have a, a comment from Pastor Charles. I don't think his microphone's on. Okay, well, you can say it, and then I'll repeat it. So. All right. It, to me, it, it means, you know, I didn't follow what you gave me literally, but it also means putting God first in our lives and everything we do. So that, to me, is the fear of the Lord. Not, like you say, not being afraid of him, but putting him first in our lives. Okay, so Pastor Charles says, the, in addition to all the other things that I mentioned, the fear of the Lord means putting God first in our lives, putting him first in all that we do. So the, uh, the king, Solomon, goes on to say this, incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Search for her as for hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. And you know, that's even echoed in the New Testament. If we can turn to, in our Bibles to the book of James, James 1 and verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. So wisdom comes from God. Another example of what King Solomon had to say was this. And this is kind of what Pastor Charles was referring to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. So wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord, making God first, having confidence and reverence and awe of him. On Thursday's lesson, it gets into quite a scientific discussion. And um, as I was preparing to teach this lesson, my head was kind of swimming. I'm like, boy, you can tell you've got PhDs <laughs> writing these Sabbath school books sometimes because it's just, ooh. <laughs> so the Lord answered Job is the subheading for this portion of the, le uh, of the lesson. Science argues that the very idea of a supernatural creator is not scientific since it can't be tested scientifically. So as I said earlier, scientific minds have to prove stuff. They go into their laboratory, they do this, they do that. Here's the proof. This is what we are looking for. But you can't confine God to a laboratory. And so since scientists cannot prove God scientifically, then they say he doesn't exist. Imagine, if you will, an older scientist who does not acknowledge God. He's devoted his whole life to finding scientific answers but he leaves God out of the picture. 
So after spending 50 years or more proving his theories and so forth, what would God say to him? The God who has no beginning and who has no ending. God would say, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And to what were its foundations fastened? When you read the book of uh, Job, and especially you start getting into the ending chapters where, where God answers out of the tornado or out of the whirlwind, then you think, wow. You know, everything that we burden ourselves down with, that we allow ourselves to be pressured by, we can just let it go because we serve the God who put everything in a systematic order that we can count on. He says, where were you when, you know, Orion was hung in the sky? Do you know if snow has a mother? God has the answers to all these questions. And when you read it, it's almost, some of it's almost kind of comical. I underlined this sentence in my quarterly. Nature is the servant of her creator. Nature is the servant of her creator. Uh-oh, what did I do? I'm just looking at this picture. I, I, I'm still in awe of mountains. I'm a Midwesterner. And the closest thing to a mountain I ever saw was a sand dune. And if you haven't been to Michigan, you don't know about sand dunes. But it's a really, really tall hill, but it's all made of sand. So when I first um, took a trip out west, and I saw a real mountain, I was just in awe. And then when I came to Arizona and saw the painted desert and saw the Grand Canyon, I was in awe. Nature testifies of an intelligence, a presence, an active energy that works in and through her laws. As we've been saying throughout this whole lesson, if you want to know God, look at the order of nature. Look at the beauty of nature. Even though the world has changed because of the sin factor, there's still so much of the beauty that remain from how God established it in its perfect state. So this is what the scripture tells us. Scripture teaches that God not only created everything, but he sustains everything as well. So when you think about the mountains, how beautiful they are. You go to California and you see the redwood forest. <laughs> you know, or you, or you just look at what happens if you put a simple seed in the earth and how it grows into a plant that bears fruit that you can eat. God is the sustainer of everything. And even when it comes to humanity, we have fallen from the station that we had when we were created. But we're still vital, vibrant, intelligent people. Why? Because God has sustained us, even in our sinful condition. Now, we've been talking about how science and art often leave God out of the equation. So Thursday's lesson 
gets into quite a discussion about the science, scientific theories that are out there. This picture shows some of the thoughts of the evolutionary world. Science claims that billions of years ago, chemicals formed by chance into simple life. And then through random mutation and natural selection, that simple life began to evolve and eventually it came to be what we see moving and breathing today. Look at those pictures. It shows that man started out as a little blob and over millions of years, he eventually evolved into something that could stand up right. Is that what you want your children to be learning? Or do you want your children to learn you were created by the hand of God out of love? Any true Christian education, okay, that's a crazy typing mistake. Okay, it should be in science. Any true Christian education in science has to work from radically different assumptions than what science in general claims. And as you can see, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's how man became a living soul, not over millions of years of mutation and random, random mutation and natural selection. It happened with a purpose in mind. What was that purpose? God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So we were created to reflect the character of God. We were made to be like him. That's what true education is all about. So if you are dealing with the sciences, you can still be a brilliant scientist and have all type of scientific breakthroughs. There's, um, I, I can't think of his name right offhand, I see, see his picture in my mind, but there's a, an Adventist scientist who develops medicines that are, are used to co combat all kinds of serious illnesses. He believes in Christ. He believes in the regenerative powers of God. So our lesson brings out that there are two reasons why science gets the origins of the species so wrong. And you can find this discussion on Friday's lesson. Once again, it's, it's very heavy reading to me. Here's the first reason. Science looks only to the natural world for answers. Our lesson says, that's fine if you're tracking a hurricane, but it's worse than worthless when you're talking about why does man exist? You can't find that answer just by looking in the natural world. The second reason why science gets origin so wrong is because science assumes that the laws of nature don't change. What's one of the laws of nature? Gravity. What goes up must come down. Or, um, you know, th things that are in motion will remain in motion unless they're interacted by a force. You know, all the stuff we learned in school, or half learned, as I probably did. <laughs> Well, here's the problem with those, two, with those two reasons that scientists offer about their, the origin. Science denies the supernatural. 
They don't believe that God had anything to do with formation of this world. You hear, hear um, people talking about the Big Bang Theory and so forth. But from the very first verse of the Bible, we are told what our origins are. Genesis 1.1 explains that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Our origins were totally supernatural. Nothing happened by accident or by chance. And then the second theory that they have is that there's constancy in nature. It says because science teaches that there is constancy in nature, in other words, it's always the same. It doesn't understand that all of nature changed when sin entered into the world. If you read the book of um, Patriarchs and Prophets, you know, they, Sister White gives us more understanding into this subject. At first, there was only one season, one beautiful, perfect temperature. I'm not sure where, um, where in our country you find that perfect temperature, maybe in some part of California. Definitely not in Michigan where I'm from. But after sin entered into the world, one thing that changed was now we have extremes in weather. You can be in Arizona and oh my goodness, how many more days is it gonna be over 110 degrees? Or you can be in Michigan and say, how many more days is it gonna be under zero degrees? That's because sin entered into the world. If you're looking at things from a purely scientific viewpoint, you don't see the reason why we have these extremes in temperature. You don't understand that there's a reason why the leaves fall from the trees in the autumn. It's not just because there are seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, but because there was a change in the face of nature when Adam and Eve made that decision not to trust God. Animals that were their friends became afraid of them, became their enemies. Death entered into the world, a world that knew no death, where man himself was made to live forever and had access to the tree of life, which would allow him to live forever. So science teaches that there's constancy in nature, so it doesn't understand that the world they're looking at is not the same as the world that God created in the beginning. So that's what this summary says here. Science gets origins wrong because it denies two crucial aspects of the creation. The first one, the supernatural force behind creation. Nothing happened by accident. God had it all planned out, and he executed his plan. Took his time, did it in six literal days, not over millions of years. And then we look at how different the original creation must have been. When God finished his creation, he said, that's very good. He just didn't say it was good. He said, it's very good. Um, my sister and I um, often laugh because we use expressions that um, were passed down in our family. And so, you know, my sister made some, some dish that was really tasty. And she said, that is good if I do say so myself. And that's what my grandmother always used to say. She was an excellent, excellent cook. And she would say, that tastes good, if I do say so myself. 
And so when God finished with creation, he, that's what he said. That's really good, if I do say so myself. And so there's a difference between that, perfect, that perfection in creation and now what we see. We see heartbreak. We see diseases. We see this pandemic we can't control. And science doesn't understand that there is a God who has a plan for everything. And his original plan was messed up by a decision that man made. So we're winding um, down with this lesson study. All fields of education, including the arts and sciences, must be taught from the perspective of a solid Christian viewpoint. We learned that a few weeks ago, I think it was back on lesson four, where we talked about the Christian worldview, how you have to look at things from the perspective of understanding that God put all of life as we know it into motion, as opposed to the sciences that contradict a knowledge of God as the originator of life or ignore it. If they, if they um, don't say God doesn't exist, they act like they don't know. So can you blend Christianity, believing in God, with arts and scientists? Look at this example. George Washington Carver. Many of you may not know that George Washington Carver was a painter. He made beautiful paintings of the things that he loved the most, plants. He painted flowers. And we all know his contributions to the world of science, how he made more than 300 products from the peanut, more than 200 products from the sweet potato. And um, one of my favorite books, I was lucky enough to find it on sale at the ABC in the, in the discard group. It was called um, Mr. Creator's Strong Brown Hands or something like that. But it tells the story of George Washington Carver, who was a firm believer in God. He loved God, but he was both an artist and a scientist. So is it possible to be a scientist? Yes, but you have to make sure that as you're studying the sciences, that you're like Daniel. When Daniel and his companions went to the University of Babylon, they were taught all kind of crazy theories, but it didn't change their viewpoint of who God was. They learned it because they had to learn the stuff in order to get their degrees, but they still had their minds made up that come what may, they would remain true and faithful to their God. So, we have this quotation from Patriarchs and Prophets in regards to our topic of uh, study for this quarter. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul that's found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 595. This verse that's on the picture says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So at the beginning, God formed man lovingly, gave him life. And after man's sin, God didn't just throw him in the trash heap. He provided a way for man to be restored to his first creation. So when you look at this picture, you see the four stages of human history. First of all, the creation. In the beginning, 
God created man in his own image. That meant he was capable of creating things himself. That meant that he was able to think and reason. Man was like God. And the funny thing, the ironic thing, is that the devil, <laughs> when he tempted Eve, told her, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. She already was like God. She had been created in his image. And so the second part of our history is the fall. And Sister White makes this statement, again from Patriarchs and Prophets, same page as the other quotation. Sin has marred and well nigh obliter obliterated the image of God in man. If you don't know what that means, erasing the face of God from man. Look at the evil that's done, the crimes of humanity against humanity. Sin has well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. Thankfully, we mentioned God's characteristic is love. Love said, I'm not going to let them go. It was to restore the image of God that the plan of salvation was devised. So the third part of our human history is the redemption. That's why we can sing Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Because without Christ's sacrifice, where would we be? We would be nothing. God would have just let us die and go back to the ground from which we came. And that would have been it. So we have the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, and what is the end of the plan of salvation? Restoration. To bring man back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life. This is what true education is all about. Explaining who we are, where we came from, and more importantly, where we are going. So this is our final picture. The great work of life is character building. And a knowledge of God is the foundation of all true religion, of all true education. Let me read that again since I messed it up. The great work of life is character building. As you can see, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes time. The work of changing us from our sinful, selfish selves takes a lifetime. But as we learn more of Jesus, then we begin to take on his characteristics. We begin to be re formed, reshapen into his image. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education. So whether we're teachers, whether we're students, this still applies to each and every one of us. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education. We have to know who God is for ourselves. And once we understand who God is and what he has done for us, then we're able to, in turn, pass it on. And just like the picture I showed of the lily of the valley, it will spread from person to person. So that concludes our lesson for today. And um, next week, we're going to be learning about the Christian and work.
You know, I have, I have friends that I work with that say, I, I have two more years and then I'm gonna retire. So we're gonna find out in next week's um, study what, what um, the Bible has to say about work. Let's bow our heads now for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us as we opened your word this morning and studied about education and what true education means. Lord, we ask that you would give each one of us the thirst for knowledge, the hunger for more of you. Help us not to be content with just a superficial religion, Lord, but help us to understand that we can be remade in your image. We ask that you would help each one of us to be more than what we used to be. Lift us up from where we have fallen. Let Jesus be seen in our lives as we go about our daily duties and activities. More than anything else, Lord, we need a touch from you, just as you touched Adam, formed him, and brought him to life. Please give us that new life in you so that we can be what you intended us to be. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.